Hi everyone, I'm Zoe Francis, Health Promotion Coordinator of the Regional Strategy for the Prevention of Violence Against Women at WISE. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. I want to thank everybody for being here today, super high levels of engagement that we have today, so thank you for your commitment to this work. Um, and of course, in this current environment, it's um, even more important than ever. In a moment, we'll be moving to our guest speakers. Um, so a warm welcome this morning to Suzette Mitchell, Senior Intersectionality Research Advisor at Respect Victoria. We'll be then moving to hear from Karen Fairburn, Principal Policy Officer at F Family Safety Victoria, and then Mary Lee, Senior Project Officer also at Family Safety Victoria. Thank you so much for being part of today's webinar. I'd like to move to um, webinar housekeeping this morning. I think webinars and online meetings are something that we're all getting very used to at the moment. But just quickly, just to let you know, today we've allotted two hours. Um, obviously being a webinar, um, you can see us as the panelists, but we can't see you. Uh, so in that view, please do feel free um, to jump up and grab yourself a cup of tea uh, or stretch at any point um, to change the view. Um, we recommend going to the top right hand corner and selecting speaker view That's the best functionality for your webinar today. And if you do have any questions today, which we hope you do, please type them in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. And we encourage you to use that over the chat function if that's okay. So just pop any questions that you have at any point into the Q&A. Um, you will also see questions from other people in there. And we encourage you to upvote any of those existing questions that you feel are relevant and would like to support being answered. Lastly, this webinar um, is being recorded and the webinar recording and the slides will be shared with you in the next few days. I'd like to move to uh, acknowledgement of country. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I am on the traditional lands of the Bunurong and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples here joining us this morning. I'd like to acknowledge um, also um, that you spend a moment reflecting on which country you are on today. Fundamentally, we are settlers on Aboriginal land, and an intersectional approach must acknowledge Australia's colonial history in order to ethically unpack and discuss other forms of discrimination in Australia. I'd like to acknowledge it was for that reason that we began our series of um, communities of practice on intersectionality, um, which was in February, and that, that that had a sole focus on Aboriginal self-determination. And we chose to do that in order to mitigate any risk or mitigate as much as possible any risk around um, an intersectional approach subordinating or compartmentalizing the Aboriginal experience. So today, very excited to welcome our guest speakers. Um, what is intersectionality? Well, we're here today to hear all about that, and we're going to move through from the theory um, towards the practice. What is intersectionality? Well, it essentially, in a nutshell, describes characteristics such as gender, gender identity, Aboriginality, ethnicity, ability, sexual orientation, religion, age, etc., and how they can interact and intersect on multiple levels to create overlapping forms of discrimination and power imbalance. And the aim of our communities of practice is to really get to grips with the theory as a region and then to move towards the how. Some of you will already be doing this work and we want to acknowledge that and others will be very, very new to it. And this is um, your space to share and learn together. How can we enact feminist informed intersectionality theory in our region, in our organizations and ultimately in our lives? Moving to briefly to touch upon the outline for today's session. So in a moment, I'm going to pass you over to uh, Suzette Mitchell from Respect Victoria, who's going to present to us a really rich background that she has um, in intersectional practice and the evolution as well of intersectional um, frameworks, both in the international and the Victorian context. So we we'll look forward to that. We then have an opportunity to um, ask questions for Suzette. 
before moving on to hear from Family Safety Victoria, we're going to hear from Karen Fairburn and Mary Lee, and we're looking forward to hearing more um, about the intersectionality capacity building project, Everybody Matters, and some practical tools that are being um, developed for us um, prevention practitioners um, as we speak. And then again, we have an opportunity for questions from Karen and Mary, and then we'll move to a virtual Q&A panel 15 minutes before moving to close. Okay, so at this point, I would like to um, pass over and introduce you to Suzette Mitchell and um, for your presentation, Suzette, on um, intersectionality and the frameworks in the Victorian and international context. Welcome, Suzette. Thank you so much, Zoe. I am just going to load my presentation and share screen. Firstly, I would like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we are and um, pay my respects to Indigenous people um, past, present and emerging and also acknowledge that today is um, National Sorry Day and tomorrow starts Reconciliation Week. So, uh, as Zoe said, I'm going to talk a little bit about the translation of theory into practice. Uh, and I've been working at Respect Victoria for a year now. My background is on um, gender and intersectionality internationally. Uh, so when I started at Respect Victoria, I began an analysis of um, what intersectionality is and how it is framed and the definitions of it um, within Victoria. So you can see on, on this slide, um, obviously it's a, a term coined by um, Kimberly Crenshaw and it looks at um, experience in oppression of varying configuration and degrees of intensity. Um, their cultural patterns, they're not only interrelation, but bound together and influenced by intersectional systems of society. Uh, and she talks specifically of race, gender, ability, and ethnicity. At this stage, I am going to stop sharing my video and um, I'm going to to turn to Lucy, who is going to show a, a very short video, but I thought it was good to begin with this because it gives an outline in uh, a, a cartoon form, which gives us a, a three-dimensional perspective to intersectionality. And most of my session is going to use uh, one-dimensional um, forms and intersectionality, because it is so interlinked, is quite difficult to uh, picture in terms of static forms. So Lucy, if you could um, get that video up, that would be fantastic. No, that's the, um, Lucy, that's Everybody Matters. That's the, the wrong video. That's the next one. There we go. Thank you. There's no sound coming through yet. Acting forms of What is intersectionality? Intersectionality is a way of understanding social relations by examining intersecting forms of discrimination. This means acknowledging that social systems are complicated and that many forms of oppression, like racism, sexism and ageism, might be present and active at the same time in a person's life. Everyday approaches to building equality tend to focus on one type of discrimination, for instance, sexism and then work to address only that specific concern. But while the career of a young, white and able-bodied woman might improve with gender equality protections, an older, black, disabled lesbian may continue to be hampered by racism, ageism, ableism and homophobia in the workplace. Intersectionality is about understanding and addressing all potential roadblocks to an individual or group's well-being. But it's not as simple as just adding up oppressions and addressing each one individually. 
Racism, sexism and ableism exist on their own, but when combined, they compound and transform the experience of oppression. Intersectionality acknowledges that unique oppressions exist, but is also dedicated to understanding how they change in combination. The roots of intersectionality lie within the black feminist movement with legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw originating the term. Crenshaw felt that anti-racist and feminist movements were both overlooking the unique challenges faced by black women. She stated that legislation about race is framed to protect black men and legislation about sexism is understood to protect white women. So simply combining racism and sexism together does not therefore protect black women. Intersectional theory is now applied across a range of social divisions and also to understandings of domination, such as those associated with whiteness, masculinity and heterosexuality. Intersectionality is not only about multiple identities and it's not a simple answer to solving problems around equality and diversity. It is, however, an essential framework as we truly engage with issues around privilege and power and work to bring them into the open. Intersectionality means listening to others, examining our own privileges and asking questions about who may be excluded or adversely affected by our work. As importantly, it means taking measurable action to invite, include and centre the voices and work of marginalised individuals. Thanks very much. I think that's a really interesting um, cartoon um, presentation because it really outlines uh, how different forms of uh, oppression or discrimination um, coalesce when they are um, combined. It obviously has a very uh, US um, focus and one of the things that Respect Victoria will be doing is revising the video and putting it in a specific context more related to Victoria where in, instead of uh, US um, black feminist um, approaches we incorporate issues um, more relevant to Australia, which addresses um, indigeneity and um, dispossession and colonialism. So what I will do in this session is outline uh, the different definitions and frameworks, what is included when we identify intersectionality, and I'll look at both government and non-government um, definitions of that. And I, whoops, uh, We'll then look at how, um, from, from digging out those different examples internationally, um, nationally, and from a state perspective, how we developed in, um, Respect Victoria's approach to intersectionality. I'll then look very briefly at some voices of a couple of women to show what it looks like in real life, and then also outline some good practice which has been um, developed in Victoria. And I have here um, a quote from Audre Lorde that says, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live um, single issue lives. And Audre Lorde um, was um, a part of um, a collective of black feminists um, that, that developed um, a statement um, early on, which led to a lot of the, the black feminist thinking and ultimately um, led into um, Kimberly Crenshaw's work so we start with um, the Royal Commission into Family Violence as really the beginning of a lot of um, intersectionality dialogue in family violence. So the Royal Commission's terms of reference had it looking at the particular needs and experiences um, of people affected by um, family violence. And it identified that children, seniors, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, people with culturally and linguistically diverse um, backgrounds, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and intersex people, people living in rural, regional and remote communities and people with a disability had specifically um, had 
characteristics which put them more at risk of violence. Um, now, obviously, these are individual characterizations and um, identities. And what intersectionality does is not look at them separately, but look at the combinations of them. Um, but it is interesting to see what categories are identified. Now, terms of reference didn't look specifically at male victims of family violence, women in prison or women working in the sex industry. However, the commission did consider it important to actually um, look at these groups as separately identified with either different forms of um, family violence or violence against women um, or um, that they were put at additional risk. So after the <clears throat> Commission for Family Violence um, was released. And certainly in the development and lead up to it, there was a lot of work um, that was done on intersectionality. And I will say that a lot of um, NGOs, particularly um, Victorian based organisations like Multicultural Centre for, for Women's Health and other um, primary prevention organisations did um, lobby in the beginning um, to have intersectionality considered and to have the specific needs of um, particular population cohorts considered. So after the report was released, there was a lot of consultation that was done by government in looking further into what the identification of these um, forms of um, discrimination um, for intersectionality were that um, provide a risk. This was developed in um, 2017 through a lot of dialogue in the Victorian community. And you can see that the, um, the identities of people um, is, is expanded in this context. So there is still sex, um, Aboriginal um, origin, age, um, it includes also um, disability, migration and visa status, language, housing status, socioeconomic status, um, religion and mental health. Um, so these are, and, and ethnicity. So these are additional to the ones that the um, Royal Commission identified. Then it actually looks at the um, contributing factors and what we'll find in intersectionality is at an individual level, they are the personal characteristics um, that we have that may make us more prone um, to family violence, but it is due to the contributing factors, the forms of discrimination at a societal level. So that's where um, this circle identifies discrimination, colonialism and dis possession, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, and all of the um, other forms in the, in the middle circle. This one then looked at lived experience and um, how that um, permeates. This has been um, revised in um, the Everybody Matters um, document on inclusion and equity. So you can see that this one has um, the social identities and systems of oppression um, being ageism, ableism, racism, sexism, homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, intersex discrimination and stigma. And then on the outside, it has the um, personal identities or characteristics of populations. I'm not gonna go into detail on this because this is the, the area that Corrine and, and Mary will discuss from Family Safety Victoria, but it does show that um, the framework has a vision which uses intersectionality um, at the top with supporting frameworks and then down the bottom with the diverse communities, which is incredibly difficult to see on this slide, but you will see that it actually follows the characteristics of the, um, the Commission into Family Violence, although it does um, separate out uh, mental health and physical disability and also has um, faith communities in there. So you will be able to get the slide um, and be able to look at that or, or look at the Everybody Matters um, document separately. So um, where did this come from? And we know that there is a very um, strong history of, of this. Um, and my background, as I said, is um, working um, on the international um, scene. And really the, the work that I've done on intersectionality has always been based on 
um, this diagram on the left. It was developed in 2009. Uh, it was developed in um, Oshawa by the Canadian Research Institute for the Advancement of Women. And it's the one that I've used over, over many years. Um, and you can see, again, I will apologize. Um, a lot of these diagrams um, will be difficult um, to see. And um, hopefully when you get the slides yourself, it will be easier to read. Um, so the, um, the light green circle um, looks at the unique circumstances of um, power, um, privilege and identity. And then we, we go out to those specific aspects of identity. And this is where we will see, um, and what I'm doing is I'm trying to track how these personal identities have been identified for us in Victoria in, in family violence. So you'll see that this has a wider um, range. It includes caste because obviously it's, it's working on an international level, um, but it also includes um, occupation and education. Um, it includes income, uh, it includes family status, and this is a really significant one. And I am going to um, pick this up throughout um, the, the session today. Um, it has um, different ones to previously, is also um, work history, citizenship status, uh, HIV status, spirituality, uh, class background. And then on the outside, again, we see the, the types of um, discrimination and prejudice, which includes classism, sexism, um, heterosexism, discrimination, racism, ableism, homophobia, ageism, and transphobia, transphobia and ethnocentrism. Um, now, one of the things I find really interesting about this diagram is that it also has an outer circle which consists of larger forces and structures which reinforce inclusion. So this is where they have placed historical forces, social forces, war, capitalism, globalization, politics, colonialization, legal system, economy, education system, and immigration. So I will come back to this outer circle of um, larger forces and structures again. It, it hasn't been referenced um, previously um, in um, frameworks for Victoria, but I do think it adds something. And one of the things I've been looking at specifically over the, the last few weeks is where do we position disasters in intersectionality? And you can see here they've got, they've mentioned war. This is where I would actually put disasters. So my background um, in, in gender um, for the last 10 years is also focused on um, the role of um, gender and social inclusion um, in disasters, disaster risk reduction, management response, and its links to climate change adaptation and um, mitigation. So these are global forces which influence us as well. So they're, they're outside um, influences that, that then um, come into all of these different spheres as well. Now, if we look at the national level and we can see the, the Commonwealth um, Fourth Action Plan um, for women and children, we can see that they again have um, these two different um, realms, which is um, the forms of discrimination. And here they have included classism, dispossession, um, religious discrimination, ableism, ageism, racism and homophobia, biphobia and transphobia. And then the individual characteristics are um, quite similar to those that we have already discussed, but also of note um, is that mental health has been um, separated um, from disability. Um, this is a really interesting diagram. Um, and the reason I find it so interesting is that the, the fourth plan of action does not actually use the word intersectionality. What it does use is the wording of leave no one behind, which comes from the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, which has similarities and overlaps to the idea of intersectionality because those who are left behind are usually those that are poor, those that are women, um, those that um, are, are str struggling with different forms of discrimination. But it, it doesn't directly reference um, 
the multiple uh, intersections um, that that individuals have and because it is um, a, a UN definition it, it does look um, very heavily at poverty um, as an indicator but there is a lot of increasing work on the overlap of leave no one behind and intersectionality uh, because the um, sustainable development goals is something that Australia nationally needs to report on to the UN I understand that they've use the context of leave no one behind because um, they will be reporting in that context but I do find it very interesting that this diagram has been taken um, and does reference um, the intersectionality framework of everybody matters yet it does not use that word um, in the narrative of the report. So now we um, we've looked at the national the, and the state um, government um, depictions of intersectionality that have emanated um, from a history um, of the Royal Commission into Family Violence. What I wanted to look at now is the model um, from our watch. And you can see that um, this is also used by the Domestic Violence Resource Centre and Gen Vic. So as I said earlier, one of the reasons I wanted to include the video at the beginning is the very difficult nature of depicting um, these, these different concepts um, in, a, in a static form. So you, you have the um, various ways of the concentric circle and here we have uh, ribbons. Um, <clears throat> so on this level, what we can see by our watch is that they have um, the equivalent of three categories again. Um, which draws back to the earlier um, 2009 model from Canada. So the green ribbon rep represents the factors that make up um, social status and identity. Um, and you can see there, there's Aboriginality, ethnicity, sex. And this is where I want to point to parent and carer status being acknowledged. Um, and I think this is really significant because we often don't consider um, fully the idea of um, motherhood as a part of intersectionality, um, particularly for um, um, single mothers. And the, the reason I, I think that is so essential is if I was to give the, the personal identities of myself um, as, um, and, and here I want to bring in that what we are depicting are, are ways that we can be privileged or disadvantaged because of these identities. So I have, I uh, inhabit a number of um, privileges, being white, being middle class, um, being university educated, um, but there are a number of different um, identities that I also inhabit, um, which form um, basis of, of discrimination. So I know I'm, I'm over 50, I'm a lesbian, I'm a single mum, my child has a disability. Um, and one of the things that is really important when we're looking at this, and I know that, that Mary and Corinne will look at this further, is, is how you identify um, your own identities. So for me, the fact that I'm a single mother is above and beyond um, more important in my everyday life than any other aspect of my identity. So if we're talking about family violence, and I, I will disclose, I um, am currently um, experiencing family violence, and it is because I have um, an autistic daughter, um, and it is the, um, the combination of um, disability and um, being a single parent. Um, I think adolescent um, violence is something that we don't discuss um, a lot um, and is an area where we um, need to increase um, both research and support. Um, but it is simply because of that um, single parent and, and disability connection um, that that, that manifests the, the um, influence of family violence in my life. Um, so this one also looks at, oh, sorry, I will also say the significant of the parent carer status um, 
is often not addressed um, in um, intersectionality, not, not only in our government frameworks, but internationally. Um, as I pointed out earlier, it, it was identified in the 2009 model. And um, being a parent is often the reason why women will stay and also the reason why women will leave um, violent relationships. Um, so it is a really critical identifier, I believe. Um, then we have sexuality, sexual identity, um, dis and ability, um, religion, migration and refugee status, age, socioeconomic and cultural background. Then um, the, the last ribbon, the grey one, and it is quite difficult to differentiate these colours, um, are the forms of discrimination. And here there is um, a lot of overlap um, by those that are um, depicted by government, but it does also um, include um, colonialism, homophobia, ageism, classism, um, as does um, the, the national um, framework and religious discrimination. So this kind of um, purpley colour one is, is a different configuration, uh, which also goes back to the 2009 Canadian model, which represents the social systems and structures which impact negatively or positively. Um, and that includes welfare, economic labour, um, legal issues, education, health and social systems. Uh, they are social systems. Um, and I will come back to that at the end of this presentation when we overlay this with the socio-economic, socio-ecological model that we use in primary prevention. But um, first, just to point out that the Equality Institute um, uses ellipses um, and the categories are actually identical to our watch and they do credit that the image has been adapted from our watch. Um, but if we are um, looking at drivers and reinforcing factors, I think it's really useful um, in family violence if we can actually identify um, that the personal characteristics and traits um, of people do, I mean, we, we've talked about the fact that we um, need to look in intersectionality at the overlapping um, forms of discrimination. Um, that impact on people due to their identities. But I don't think we can throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of the history that we have of looking at diversity and inclusion, of depicting the specific societal, community, organisational level and individual um, ways that um, discriminations um, fold out for individual groups. So for instance, um, this table by uh, the Equality Institute has gone through the categorization of personal characteristics uh, from the um, Commission on Family Violence. So it looks at women in prison, um, children, faith, women in the sex industry, disabilities, rural and remote, male victims, LGBTIQ, called older and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So um, one of the things I, I will be outlining um, later in the way that we have developed it for Respect Victoria is that we do consider that the specific issues for each of these um, personal characteristics are very important. Older people generally will experience ageism. Now, it may be that not every single um, person who is older um, has ageism as their primary identifier, um, but there are certain um, societal community uh, ways that um, ageism will play out. So we do need to, to take into account um, the specific evidence that we have that, that make these um, cohorts of people more likely to experience violence. I'm very quickly um, just going to note, this is not an NGO, this is Intertwine, which is actually um, a, a consulting um, organisation, um, but it has um, quite a different um, way of depicting this. So it depicts privilege on one side and oppression and resistance on the other side. Um, and I noted that we had a dietitian in the group who um, is interested in body form. You'll note here on the bottom, we have short, fat and unattractive, um, 
which is an interesting way to depict it, um, but that, that there are um, a number of different um, presentations um, that can also um, be addressed here um, on, on physical appearance. Um, it also um, addresses uh, infertile and childless as categories as well. So, so what is interesting here is that um, we can pick our privileges as well as our forms um, of oppression and how they um, intersect to uh, depict who we are and the forces that act upon us. So this is the Respect Victoria model, um, and you can see that the identities and personal characteristics are quite similar to government, um, but we do include parenting status, especially single mothers, um, and we do include lived experience, um, education and occupation here, and we all know that lived experience um, has, has an impact. Um, and then the discrimination and prejudice on the outside um, uh, basically echo others. Um, classism is in there, colonialism and dispossession. But what I wanted to look at is how we have then actually um, put this into the socio-ecological model. Um, so in the socio-ecological model, um, here are the individual characteristics and at the societal level, here are the forms of discrimination. Um, so at the community um, level, we have social systems and structures, and this is where um, I uh, give, uh, I, I mentioned earlier the Our Watch model, um, as well as the um, Canadian model, um, identified how this plays out um, in the community through, through different um, structures and organisations. Um, and here we have sport as well. Um, as well as uh, the legal and justice system and NGOs. Then we have um, in the socio-ecological um, model, the interpersonal um, realm where there are relationships. And this is how we um, look at social norms and stereotypes influence our own behavior. So that includes perceptions of masculinity, peer group pressure, respectful relationships, and, and very much the ways that unconscious bias um, feed into the, the ways that we interact. So there is uh, uh, the power and privilege, um, which comes um, as, a, as a downward um, force um, affecting us because of different forms of discrimination, but also um, wider diversity and inclusion um, strategies that we can make um, at all levels um, of this these um, concentric circles. And what I've done and I alluded to earlier was the wider social circle of wider forces and structures from the Canadian model. And this is where I put globalization, historical forces, disasters and climate change and geopolitics. Because we know, and I note that a number of people um, in the um, response um, to this session have said they were very interested in seeing how um, intersectionality um, relates to COVID. Um, so this is where um, you will see um, a really interesting layering of um, intersectionality because we know that ageism has been a strong um, definer um, in the COVID response where, um, you know, there were a lot of statements that only older people and people with dis with um, who are immunocompromised um, are at risk, which, you know, basically the assumption behind that is that these groups of people don't matter. Um, and so that also gets mixed with um, racism and xenophobia. We can see a lot of the ways um, that um, community responses um, by um, particular people at an individual level um, have been informed by racism, particularly of, of Chinese people um, in our community. We know that uh, at uh, homophobia, biphobia, um, transphobia, um, uh, when you are in shutdown, um, some of these people um, uh, may not be out within their, their families. There, there may be um, family members that are not supporting them. Um, specific access for these groups is, is very important. And if we also look at the 
um, migrant and refugee communities. How important is it, is it for us um, to actually make sure um, that specific information is available in languages, um, that people with disability are, are still able to access services and um, have specific um, messaging available to them. And then also from that, we look at the, the intersections. If it's an older person um, with a disability um, and um, they may also be LGBTIQ, what are the specific ways that, that we need to look at this, not just from a perspective of, of cumulative um, disadvantage, um, but also from the, the specific ways that, that this will play out. I'm going to move to how we actually put this into practice in respect to Victoria. And I note um, in the comments that some councils were saying, how do they actually look at this within their organisations? So I did this background paper and it will be available on our website site soon, which actually um, details a lot of these definitions um, and looks at how intersectionality has come to be what it is in the primary prevention space in Victoria. And from that, I then developed our um, intersectionality framework for operation within our organisation. The light blue boxes just represent the, the different functional uh, ways that, that um, we organise the, the organisation. And what I've done um, below is look at how we treat um, intersectionality as both a cross-cutting issue in all of the work we do, as well as engage in standalone um, intersectionality um, processes. So the, the light green are areas um, that have strategically um, addressed intersectionality as a cross-cutting issue. So that's in our stakeholder strategy and the development of a primary prevention alliance, making sure that representatives of specific population cohorts are present there and can uh, address the specific needs of those groups and the intersection um, of um, subgroups within them. In our learning plan, um, we, we always consider this in and in our communications that um, I spend a lot of time making sure that the um, specific and overlapping um, needs are addressed. Um, and then there is, a, uh, we have um, an intersectionality working group and we have um, a reconciliation action plan. And the reason I've included the reconciliation action plan within intersectionality is that it is um, not just um, the fact that um, we are addressing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but these, uh, but a lot, there is a lot of intersectionality here. Um, the rural and remoteness, um, specific issues for uh, LGBTIQ Indigenous people, um, age, um, a variety of, of different issues that, that interact on um, an intersectional level there. We have a diversity and equity and inclusion policy, which are ways um, of addressing this um, in processes, as well as discrimination, harassment and bullying. Um, we do specific training on intersectionality and in research and evaluation, I've developed guidelines for contractors and consultants undertaking research. And that's because um, one of the things we want to do is dig deep into the intersections. So it does mean that you will be um, looking at a number of different variables and the way that they interact, which has um, specific research implications. And I can share that for anybody who's interested. So here, I just wanted to, to give an example of um, how people identify within their intersections. And here we have Jack's Jackie Brown, who's a disability um, feminist who's queer. And she talks of living intersectionality, how it shapes her life and her politics. And she gives the example um, in the disability community where it can be homophobic, biphobic and transphobic. And she gives an example um, when she posted in an NDIS forum where people assumed the gender of her partner to be male and she was met with homophobic responses. So she talks about the need to get better at intersectionality and how we need to be able to talk about behaviour that is problematic, exclusionary or reinforces privilege. 
She says disability does not negate gendered privilege, but often people outside the disability community, as well as those within it, presume that it does, which saddens and frustrates her. I've also got an example here of Celeste Liddell, um, an Aboriginal um, trade union activist. Um, and she says, when it comes to intersectionality, we have to be incredibly careful because without that strong structural analysis of what is happening at the levels of, of discrimination and without the commitment to the rights of other human beings and the notion of equality for all, without using privilege to elevate the voices who have less rather than talking over them in the name of being an ally, it runs the risk of being identity politics doomed for nothing more than a circular game of oppression Olympics. And by that, it's kind of like, it, it's not like my forms of, um, I have more forms of um, oppression than you. I, uh, you know, mine impact on, on me um, with an increasing um, intersection. I mean, we, we actually just need to, to look at um, from a family violence perspective, how people are identifying the intersections, how they play out, how they put them more at risk and how specific services um, need to respond to that. So I'm going to finish with this slide, I think right on time, but I can see that there are four questions up there, um, with ways that the Victorian community has done this. Um, so on the right hand side, um, you'll see the Building Respectful Community Strategy um, from Women's Health in the North. They have integrated intersectionality within their um, strategic plan very well. And for those of you who are interested in an example, that's a good one to look at. Rainbow Tick um, looks at um, integrating an LGBTIQ friendly approach, but it also uses um, the lens of age. Um, so the intersection of um, age and LGBTIQ issues is, is very strong in that. Um, in the Reshaping Respect um, program for, from Women's Health in the East, they have looked at the intersection of age and um, sexuality and LGBTIQ status by looking specifically at um, LGBTIQ youth. Um, and that, that is a primary prevention program um, that used a participatory approach um, to develop a practice guide for young people. And um, one of the first um, publications on this issue um, in Victoria was, was led by the Multicultural um, Centre for Women's Health on the far left. And it talks about um, intersectionality um, and intersections in regard to the um, immigrant and refugee communities um, preventing violence against women. And that's a very helpful guide in the prevention space um, for anybody who is interested so I, I can't actually see the questions on the screen. So um, Lucy and Zoe, I, I am going to stop sharing my screen now and I can um, go to questions and maybe I can see some of those. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, very much indeed, Suzette, for sharing with us um, your your journey, essentially. I think it was great to hear about the evolution of your work and the experience of intersectionality from an international state and workplace perspective. Um, it's always really good. Um, I think it was good to see Respect Victoria's intersectionality framework, because um, that gives us that real practical feel for how, how we can do this work at the strategic level inside our organisations. And thanks too for sharing um, the voices of others and your very personal experience as well. So. Thank you very, very much. Um, so we do have quite a few questions, um, but yep, we've got some time. So that's great. You're perfect finishing on time there. Thank you. So um, the first question we'd like to ask, um, if you're happy to, is um, one from Juliana who said, how do we address this to the emerging black communities across Australia? How do we address this to the emerging black, black communities? communities okay. Yes, that are emerging across Australia. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that um, family violence um, does is actually um, looks at um, 
different structures of ways of defining um, family violence um, within um, Indigenous communities and um, that it is very much led by communities themselves. And this, I think, is, is um, critical to intersectionality in what I was saying earlier, that it is the way that people identify and their lived experience. Um, I, I think it is um, critical that, that we consider the individual voices and the ways that um, dispossession, colonialism um, play out in current society um, and um, affect Indigenous people. So, so certainly um, within um, both the reconciliation um, work we do, but also the, the practical work that, that we do in um, family violence for Indigenous communities, it is um, a really central and critical component of intersectionality. So um, Respect Victoria has, has four different um, key um, principles, which are um, self-determination, human rights, gender equality, and intersectionality. And I think they're all intertwined. I mean, an intersectionality approach um, for us, um, considering um, self-determination, means that we will always look at the intersections that, that people face. Um, but that we will um, also um, have separate and um, priority um, focus um, for Indigenous people because um, there are um, a lot of um, historical reasons that we um, need to, to make um, uh, reparations. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that's a really important point that the, the um, Aboriginal experience is at the centre of this work. Um, I'm wondering actually in that question, and it's always difficult, isn't it? This is uh, the drawbacks, I guess, of working um, in a digital space, is whether um, the intention behind that question from Juliana was actually pointing to um, African, Black African um, communities, because it does say emerging. I'm just wondering, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I just wondered if you, if you might want to um, um, address that point in case that was the intention there. Can you repeat the question, sorry? Yeah, so it's how do we address this to the emerging black communities across Australia? Yeah, so it is, it is very much um, within, um, based within um, a lot of the work, again, um, that primary um, practitioners have been doing. And, and here I would um, refer, I know that we've got um, a couple of members from InTouch online. Um, I think the work of organisations um, like InTouch and Multicultural Centre for Women's Health have been working at the coalface um, of issues for um, people from um, either Black African or um, other um, specific um, migrant and refugee um, communities or um, organisations, um, sorry, um, groups that, that may be um, living with a culture other than um, an Anglo-Celtic one. Um, they, they have developed um, a lot of work in this area. And as with um, Indigenous people, it is, it is putting that specific identity um, as a focus um, and seeing how um, racism, um, perhaps religious discrimination, um, certainly um, we had nationality, citizenship status, um, and um, skin colour as identifiers. How do these, um, when they manifest, when they manifest, um, roll out to, to put people um, at um, increased risk? But in that, we need to look at the um, social norms and um, perceptions in the community um, that create um, specific stereotypes, um, which lead to um, structural forms of discrimination and exclusion um, from either services um, or information. Can I um, just put in my own um, comment here as well? One of the things I, I wanted to discuss in, in terms of um, disasters is that um, in, in the context of disasters, that there is like a, a, a process. There is um, preparedness um, for disasters um, happening, like being um, prepared beforehand, um, even though it may be a surprise when it comes. Um, but um, then there is the um, response and management. Um, then there is the recovery. So at the moment, um, we are in the um, 
response part of COVID. Um, but we are in the recovery time from the bushfires. Um, and one of the cyclic things about this is that we actually also currently need to be in the preparedness stage um, for the next season of bushfires, because what will be um, unique about the coming season is we know that we will have some bushfires, but we are currently still under some COVID restrictions. And um, just looking at the um, the floods in the Philippines at the moment and, and various different natural disasters that are happening around the world. Um, looking at um, specific forms of violence, and we all know that violence increases because of um, uh, disasters. Um, how will that um, pan out given that there are evacuation centres that people need to go to if their houses um, disappear? Um, but we are under these lockdowns. So one of the very interesting things about COVID is its, um, is its differentiation that we are actually um, isolated within our own homes, which develops COVID specific um, issues for um, family violence um, because of both COVID coercive factors, um, plus the um, increased stress and tension of, of being excluded and not having external help and then how all of those issues then um, manifest. Um, one of the things we don't do, I think, very well in the prevention community is, is really look at disasters as um, a whole separate area um, where we need to consider um, gender and intersectionality in the preparedness response um, and recovery process. We're learning a lot of that on the run at the moment. And I will just say that um, Gen Vic is running a session tomorrow on um, global to local um, gender and COVID um, disaster, which draws from decades of work um, in this area. And um, I do think it is important that we, we look at this um, from an intersectionality perspective. Um, Respect Victoria is also um, hosting, um, oh, sorry, um, some training um, with the Gender and Disaster Pod who've done a lot of work in Victoria, specifically related to the bushfires, um, but they do look at the intersection of, of gender and LGBTIQ status and how those issues are intrinsically um, linked to um, disaster preparedness um, response and management. And we will have a, um, a two day training coming up on the 4th and 5th of June, so people can contact me on that. Sorry. Great, no, thank you very much, is it? Thank you. Um, there's another question we've got here, if you're happy to answer it. It's um, essentially, um, is, really po is it really possible that the communities that you mentioned experience higher rates of family violence, or is it that services and response are created for cisgender, heterosexual women? Um, so yeah, what do you think on that one? Um, both. Um, I think um, there are, often different forms of violence um, for specific groups. So LGBTIQ um, people will, um, well, studies have shown that um, they have equal rates of violence, um, although um, for some, and <laughs> within LGBTIQ, we, we also can't, like with um, migrant and refugee communities, as pointed out earlier, issues for, for black African communities um, will be different to, um, you know, a Burmese refugee. Um, within the LGBTIQ community, um, there will be um, different issues for um, lesbians, trans. So there are different forms of violence. Um, um, trans people suffer um, much greater forms of discrimination. Um, there is less bystander action, um, which happens for them. Um, and um, also LGBTIQ communities um, suffer um, discrimination with people um, possibly um, threatening to out them, um, which are also um, forms of violence. Um, so uh, there, some, there, there are some um, studies that show that um, these groups may experience higher rates of violence, um, and that would um, specifically be um, Indigenous women. But there is also a very intrinsic link 
on how different forms of discrimination, homophobia, um, racism, uh, provides a context within society that makes it harder for these people um, to access support, even though they may not necessarily be experiencing higher rates of violence. But what we don't have is research that is looking at the intersections of these. So one of the things we're doing at Respect Victoria is currently doing research on um, parenthood and LGBTIQ. Um, so we don't um, have a lot of data on um, the rates of violence um, in the um, peri and post um, parenthood period. Um, is it similar? Um, is it different for heterosexual couples when they first have a child? Um, so it is emerging, um, looking at those intersections. And um, yes, sometimes we don't have the data and the data can't stop us um, from using a lens of, of looking at power and privilege and how that affects us. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Suzette. Um, so what we might do now is um, we've got plenty more questions for the end of our session um, but thank you for taking the time to address some of those questions we will endeavor to we are recording the session so what we might do is see if there's a possibility to um, answer some of the questions um, with the panelists and get those to you um, post the webinar um, but yes just want to thank you again um, Suzette Mitchell for your presentation today um, and we will now move to the second part of today's webinar, um, which is the presentation from Karen Fairburn and Mary Lee from Family Safety Victoria. And then we'll join you again in a moment, Suzette, um, at the end for our Q&A panel. So um, I'd like to introduce Karen Fairburn. Karen has a background in program management and project management in the areas of maternal and child health, inclusion, school nursing and public health and she is the Principal Policy Officer at Family Safety Victoria. Karen will um, present firstly, and then we'll move um, to um, um, Mary Lee, who is the Senior Project Officer at Family Safety Victoria on the Intersectionality Capacity Building Project. Mary has a background in program development, workforce capacity building, and in, always in the context of family violence. So, um, yep, when you're ready, Karen, if you'd like to, um, move to towards sharing your slides and thank you very much. Great, thanks Zoe. Share my screen. Um, thanks Zoe and thank you Suzette for that in-depth and comprehensive presentation on intersectionality. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for having us here today at your Community of Practice webinar to speak about Family Safety Victoria's work to embed intersectionality across the family violence service system. Um, we too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we're present today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal elders who may be participating with us today. Um, so, as Zoe said, my name is Corinne Fairbairn and I'm the Principal Policy Officer at Family Safety Victoria in the Inclusion and Equity team. And I'm working with Mary Lee on the Intersectionality Capacity Building Project, which we're here to speak to you about today. Um, I'm fairly new to the project, whereas Mary's been working on it since its inception and has um, a great in-depth knowledge of the project. So, I'm going to commence our presentation with some background regarding how intersectionality has become a key focus in family violence reforms in Victoria. Um, it's key focus in Everybody Matters, Victoria's inclusion and equity statement and provides some background on the intersectionality capacity building project. Um, Mary then is gonna discuss the intersectionality capacity building project and how it will support the sector to embed an intersectional approach. Um, talk about their resources, how they've been shaped by sector consultation, some of the learnings from the project and next steps. And then we're happy to take some questions. So the impetus to embed an intersectionality approach um, in the family violence service system, as Suzette's alluded to, um, and across government led policy and strategy commenced with the Royal Commission into Family Violence 
which in 2016 highlighted the failures of the family violence service system in providing inclusive, equitable and accessible support for people who have experienced or are experiencing family violence. The Royal Commission identified that the service system has traditionally been ill-equipped to respond to the complexities of individuals' experiences and that this poses systemic barriers to accessing timely and appropriate support. It also recognised that for some groups in the community, family violence is less visible and less well understood by service providers in the broader community and that their experiences were not necessarily reflected in current government frameworks. And CZAT's been through in depth um, the groups that were highlighted by the Royal Commission in addition to those that weren't but need to be recognised. Though the Royal Commission acknowledged that many factors combine to create an individual's identity and experience and the importance of avoiding categorising people by simply referring to one aspect of their identity and intersectionality was called out as a concept that could usefully support the service system to better meet the needs of individuals. The importance of intersectionality to the family violence reforms was also emphasised to the Victorian government through sector consultation following release of the Royal Commission's report. In response to the Royal Commission and this key sector advocacy, a diverse communities and intersectionality working group was established. And this included people with lived experience, sector representatives, representatives from diverse communities. And the role of the group was to provide guidance and, on, and expertise on the needs of diverse communities across the family violence and social reform sectors. And this group was key in shaping the intersectionality capacity building work as well that we're gonna talk about today. Additionally, key family violence reform has been informed by an intersectionality approach. So the MARAM framework and practice guidance incorporates in an intersectional lens in family violence, risk assessment and management. Building from strength to strength, the 10 year industry plan for family violence prevention and response highlights the importance of building capability around diversity and intersectionality and DELTJA, the Aboriginal-led Victorian Agreement for Accountability in ensuring Aboriginal people live free from family violence, along with self-determination, highlights intersectionality as important to recognising the inequalities and discrimination faced by Aboriginal people. And as Zoe mentioned, we understand that Kiwa Lovett spoke about that in depth at your previous meeting. Um, and finally, Everybody Matters. Everybody Matters is Victoria's 10 year vision for a more inclusive, safe, responsive and accountable family violence system. And it was developed in consultation in December and um, 2017 and 18 and released in 2019. And the consultation was pretty in depth and involved people um, with lived experience of family violence, the service sector and representatives from diverse communities and Aboriginal communities. And some of the key messages that were heard in the consultation period were that individuals express multiple forms of diversity, identity and belonging, that individual differences across varied settings hold meanings in society that can interact on multiple levels to create overlapping forms of discrimination and exclusion. And that experiences of exclusion within the family violence service system are reflective of these systemic barriers and that service responses based on the individual rather than addressing these systemic barriers fails to foster inclusion and equity in the system. So here we have a quote from the chair of the intersectionality working group, Leah Van Poppel, which highlights the experiences of diverse communities of family violence and of the family violence service system. So it became evident through the consultation process um, for Everybody Matters that inter an intersectionality framework and approach was key to creating a more inclusive and equitable family violence service system. Everybody Matters was, a, was released in 2019 and the key aims of Everybody Matters are to build a more inclusive family violence system through systemic change and building capabilities, knowledge and specialisation. 
and to provide a pathway for system and organisational change to ensure that everyone has access to the same level of service, no matter who they are or where they turn to for help. To achieve this, Everybody Matters states that intersectionality must be embedded at all levels and inform the way we all undertake our work. So this slide visualises the approach articulated in Everybody Matters in that family violence is everybody's business and creating a truly inclusive and equitable and safe and responsive service system means doing so across universal services that have a role in identifying and responding to immediate risk across family violence services and this includes in government departments, the orange door, uh, for police, the courts, the justice system and child and family services. In the specialist family violence services and specialist sexual assault services and in targeted services that provide support for particular community groups and who hold expectation expertise for particular community groups. So this slide shows Everybody's Matters vision for creating a truly inclusive and safe family violence service system in Victoria. So it embeds an intersectionality approach as a new standard for the service sector. And embedding an intersectionality approach across the service system is supported by existing frameworks, including human rights and strength-based trauma-informed, culturally safe and person-centered practice. And the vision is to be achieved by its three strategic priorities, including building knowledge, building capa capacity and capability, and strengthening targeted services. So intersectionality, as articulated and championed in Everybody Matters, acknowledges the feminist roots of intersectionality and denotes the term coined by Kimberly Crenshaw um, as Suzette's discuss, she's a feminist civil rights activist and legal, legal scholar. And intersectionality provides a framework to understand how systems and structures intersect and interact on multiple levels to create barriers and overlapping forms of discrimination, stigma, power imbalances based on social characteristics. So, Embedding intersectionality, um, by doing so we acknowledge, we only truly understand lived experience of family violence by acknowledging how multiple and overlapping forms of discrimination, for example, gender inequality and racism intersect to shape experiences uh, and access to support. And that intersectionality is a lens to view and remove systemic barriers within the system and provide more safe and equitable support. So coming now to the intersectionality capacity building project, which Mary's going to speak to more in depth. It's one of the immediate priorities of Everybody Matters and responds to the strategic priority of building capability and capacity. You can also see on this slide other key priorities for Everybody Matters and importantly, Family Safety Victoria will be developing a designing for inclusion toolkit for its own staff which will assist staff to embed an intersectionality approach in all the business of Family Safety Victoria. And there'll also be an inclusion action plan for the Orange Door. So I'm now gonna to turn to Mary, who's gonna discuss the intersectionality capacity building project in detail and how it's gonna support <clears throat> the family violence response sector to embed an intersectionality approach. Um, how the project's been shaped by key sector stakeholders what's been learnt today and the next steps for the project. And I'll just stop sharing my screen. Great. Thanks, Corinne. Hi, my name is Mary. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land in which we are all virtually meeting today. Just give me a second while I set up my slides and share my screen. 
There we go. I hope everyone can see it. I'm currently in a room where I don't have my camera on, so I apologise that you can't see me speaking. You can um, see my um, profile picture. So um, I'll speak to the intersectionality capacity building project. Um, as Corinne said, it is a immediate priority of Everybody Matters, the inclusion and equity statement. Um, throughout the process of developing the Everybody Matters inclusion and equity statement, Family Safety Victoria heard very clearly from sector stakeholders that while there was a fair understanding of intersectionality as a theory, what sectors were grappling with was the actual how to apply intersectionality in practice within their organisations. Um, the project was born out of those discussions and commenced in 20, um, October 2018 to support the implementation of Everybody Matters. It aims to build capacity across the family violence service system to apply an intersectional framework so that collectively, we as organisations and as individual workers can better understand and respond to the systemic barriers to access, equity and inclusion, such as systemic discrimination and biases through colon colonialism, racism sexism, homophobia, ableism, just to name a few. So um, the rationale and approach was that the project involved a comprehensive targeted five stage consultation process from March 2019 to February 2020. Um, this included a cross section of leaders and workers from across the family violence service system, individuals who have expertise in intersectionality and organisations who provide support to specific population group groups. Um, the project also consulted with various working groups outside of our targeted consultation group. These groups were the Diverse Communities and Intersectionality Working Group, the Victim Survivors Advisory Council, the LGBTIQ Family Violence Working Group, the Inclusion and Equity Cross-Government Working Group, um, the Pr Principal Strategic Advisors, um, the CASA Forum and the, the Delkja Regional Coordinators. So throughout this process, we heard a lot about what would be required. And so um, we've developed a suite of resources that will support workforces to embed an intersectionality framework through a systemic and organisational approach to collectively better understand and respond to the systemic barriers within an Australian context. The resources will also support workforces to begin understanding their own positions of power, working towards building reciprocal partnerships and facilitate referral pathways to provide appropriate, inclusive and responsive services for any persons living in Victoria seeking support for um, who are experiencing family violence, uh, sexual assault or for any family and, and child, child well-being um, requirements. So the definition that you see on your screen um, is a working definition of intersectionality. This definition has been built upon the concept of intersectionality introduced in Everybody Matters. This approach recognises the systemic issues and the individual approach that needs to be undertaken to reduce systemic barriers across the whole service system to ensure that no one falls through the gaps. So I'll, I'll read it out to um, everyone in the room, oh, everyone in the webinar. Um, so intersectionality is is a framework that helps us understand how power intersects and conspires within systems and structures, creating overlapping forms of discrimination or disadvantage for either an individual or a group based on social characteristics such as, but not limited to, gender, sexuality, um, sexual orientation, ethnicity, language, religion, class, socioeconomic status, gender identity, ability or age. Intersectionality also helps us understand our own individual circumstances, our position of power and our experiences within those systems, structures and institutions that organise our society. By truly understanding our own position of power, we will be able to critically reflect and work towards removing the systemic barriers for all. Now, the reason why we've looked at this, um, building upon the definition of intersectionality within this context, it is because we are looking at um, develop our resources we're looking at developing are for organisations and um, individual workers. So for us, it was um, paramount that 
as workers within organisations and within systems, we have to understand our own individual circumstances and what our position of power is and how we can influence to change those systems. This also is a line with Everybody Matters core to action where we um, had the four C's that Corinne also spoke about. Um, so the slide that you see on your screen right now is the resources overview of what kind of resources we um, developed. Um, and so these were all developed in um, in collaboration with the um, sector stakeholders. Sorry, I apologise. I, I have children in the background, so if you hear them coming through, that's what's happening. Um, and for us, uh, we listened to a lot of the feedback coming through from the stakeholders and we went about creating these resources. Uh, we have a series of essential knowledge tip sheets for all in the organisation. So what is intersectionality? That looks at the definition of intersectionality, how it was defined and built upon, uh, defined, um, coined by Kimberly Crenshaw and how it's built upon the feminist underpinning. Um, we have a knowledge tip sheet on on intersectionality in the Australian context. So again, as Corinne and uh, Suzette have mentioned, it is um, paramount that we look at creating um, an understanding of intersectionality within the Australian context. So our resource will talk about um, intersectionality underpinning, underpinned by colonisation and how intersectionality complements Aboriginal self-determination. Um, we have a, a, a central knowledge on why is an intersectionality framework important to organisations and again framing it within organisations and for workers. Really it's about understanding self and how organisations play a part within the wider system to make it better for all Victorians um, and a, a sheet on intersection, intersectionality in practice. What does that actually mean for executives and boards? What it, does it mean for managers? What does it mean for frontline workers? What does it mean for organisations to look at it from a um, internal perspective but also from an outward facing perspective? What does that also mean? We heard from stakeholders the importance of having um, tip sheets for managers, team leaders and supervisors and executives and boards. So we created two tip sheets on taking the lead on an intersectional approach um, and incorporating an intersectionality framework across policies and procedures. So um, those were specifically for those in leadership positions to really start thinking about what you could do uh, at an organisational level. Um, then we had uh, tip sheets for all. This is for everyone in an organisation. Um, a tip sheet on critical reflection. So through the conversations we had with stakeholders, it was um, it came to it was quite apparent how critical reflection was something that was required for. Um, having an understanding on intersectionality, because when we're talking about intersectionality, we're talking about understanding power and privilege and what that means for us as individuals and in within systems. And so it means that we have to be able to critically reflect on our own positions of power, our own positions of marginalisation and oppression, and how we interact within a workplace and also out in community. And, um, and critical reflection allows us to really self-analyze and think about these things because what we're talking about are topics that aren't, aren't generally talked about. So they can cause levels of discomfort. And so it was really crucial to have a tip sheet on critical reflection. Then again, with intersectionality, it is about centering the voices of marginalised people and their lived experience. And we heard from stakeholders the importance of embedding lived experience in service delivery, having tip sheets on how to have respectful and safe engagement with individuals with lived experience, and also um, practical tips and tricks on supporting a diverse workforce. Um, again, because we're looking at the focus being on creating a inclusive and equitable service system, we created a tip sheet on building strong partnerships for inclusion and looking at what types of partnerships are out there and what would be useful in this context. We um, created a facilitating inclusive referral and response pathways as a tip sheet as well that builds upon the strong partnerships for inclusion. We created a auditing and monitoring tip sheet 
um, so organisations could look at how they're going in um, tracking how they embed intersectionality in the work that they do in an organisation, but also in research and evaluation. Um, I just also want to mention that with these tip sheets, we worked within uh, with our MARIM team as well to ensure that they aligned with the MARIM um, practice guidelines and to, to make sure that this information complements all the work that is um, happening with the MARIM framework. Um, and uh, we also created uh, some ongoing tools to support um, organisations. So an organisational self-assessment tool, which looks at key areas across an organisation to track um, how you can embed intersectionality into your policies, procedures, um, and uh, any sort of training or staff development. Um, we tried to make sure that with the organisational self-assessment assessment tool, um, that it could be something that also complements existing auditing tools um, because we we heard a lot from organizations that there there was a lot of audit tools out there and they didn't want to be overwhelmed by it with additional audit tools so we've tried to create a self-assessment tool that can help um, organizations look at uh, existing audit tools and um, support that work as well. We created an inclusion inclusive language guide because we heard a lot from stakeholders about the need to have inclusive language and what that means for the people you work with and how you communicate through to communities. We also heard about um, the importance of having a guide to safe and respectful conversations because again we are talking about things that can be uncomfortable that can bring to light um, issues and acts of resistance so we did create a guide to safe and respectful conversations to help help guide organizations to have these conversations we also um, included uh, created a practical tool on critical reflective practice activities. So look, using some of the critical reflective practice models out there, we've kind of contextualized them for um, to reflect a bit more nuancing with intersectionality and understanding um, positions of power, um, privilege and um, social location. Now with these resources, um, we, I hope that there will be tools for organisations to be able to analyse and consider their own structural barriers and organisational power imbalances and other barriers to access inclusion and equity. Um, we hope to finalise the resources in mid-2020 and uh, recognise that these tools and resources will be useful to begin an organisational and whole of systems shift to the medium to long term. Um, we see that this shift as a result in um, better understanding the needs and how to better support and address these issues. So we see the, the intersectionality capacity building resources as um, resources to help nudge social change and help nudge all of us to start thinking more critically about how we can challenge existing systems. Um, we, you know, with the resources, we once they we once they're finalised, we will commence an implementation phase to test and pilot the effectiveness of the products with um, the key family violence workforces as well, as well as the broader workforce. Um, these resources will be living documents. Um, we want to work with organisations to capture feedback about how they can be enhanced and refined to increase usability and effectiveness. Um, these resources are a the first of it, their kind. Um, when we were going through the initial stages, there, there are a lot of resources out there that looked at specifically how you contextualise intersectionality for organisations. So we're really conscious that these are new and emerging um, resources and we want to make sure that they are living documents to that can be adapted and can be um, updated um, based on the experiences of people in the service in the sectors using them. We also aim to evaluate the impact um, to of how you can how we're lifting intersectional analysis and capacity building across the broader family violence service system just so we can gauge how effective these resources have been so on to that um, as i mentioned before critical reflection is a key component of these resources um, and um, 
through the stakeholder consultation, these were some key questions that kept coming up and we thought that these are the kind of questions, the kind of critical reflections that, um, practical questions that all individuals working within the service system should reflect on when applying an intersectional approach. Um, questions such as what is my social location and position of power? How are my assumptions, biases informing my decisions and actions? What voices and perspectives are being heard and unheard in the work that I do? Uh, how am I supporting unheard voices being brought to life? And how do I use my position of power to influence change within the broader family violence service system? So critical reflection is an important component of applying intersectionality in practice. We need to constantly ask these questions of ourselves about so social location, power and privilege as champions of change and as a process of ongoing learning. These questions must be asked at an organisational and systems level and not solely rest on individual workers. Um, because to critically analyse and consider structural and organisational power, we need to recognise what those power imbalances are and what those power dynamics are so we can actually challenge systemic barriers to inclusion and equity. Now, the next slide. Um, I'll just provide a brief overview now on some of the challenges that we've um, uh, had uh, going through this process. So um, throughout our work uh, collaborating with stakeholders, we've come across some tensions and challenges and opportunities for change, and we would like to share them today. A key consideration when doing this work um, expressed by stakeholders we consulted with was the need to build on the gendered lens of family violence. We heard very clearly the importance of the gender lens in order to appropriately understand the nature and dynamics of family violence, and as well as to continue to recognise family violence as deeply rooted, um, deeply gendered and rooted in structural inequality. We all heard that it's important to ensure that the application of intersectionality to responses to family violence does not dilute or water down the gendered lens. And the Victorian government acknowledges the gender nature of family violence and is committed to the gender framework in understanding and responding to family violence. So our work in intersectionality certainly seeks to build on the foundational gendered understandings of family violence, using the framework to enhance our understandings and our responses to family violence. A work In our work, we are, as we mentioned before, we have recognised intersectionality as being rooted in the work of feminist activists and specialist family violence services over the number of decades. And recognising these orig origins means that a gender lens is always important to a framing of intersectionality. And so, you know, we understand that and we are for us, it's building upon the gendered lens and shining a light to other diverse communities who experience um, other structural inequalities and how that's further compounded in their experiences of family violence. We also heard the challenge of the tension between capacity building of mainstream services and targeted services who support diverse communities. So stakeholders told us it's important to build the capacity of both mainstream services and targeted services and um, that upskilling service mainstream services and building the capacity of services with specialization is important to creating a inclusive system because it gives service users the greater choice in where to go for help and support uh, referral path pathways. In turn, targeted services that worked with particular diverse community groups expressed concern that if mainstream services become more inclusive, these targeted services may lose their place as specialist service providers in the sector and lose available funding investment along with it. Now, within our work at Family Safety Victoria, throughout Everybody Matters, throughout the prior immediate priorities that we're working on, we are building capacity and workforce capability across the broad, broader family violence system, while simultaneously strengthening our targeted services um, to ensure that we provide choice and non-discriminatory uh, service provision and statewide access um, to all people across Victoria. Now I'm going to go through some key learnings. So this, from the work undertaken so far, we've gathered some important learnings. That a shared understanding of intersectionality across the family violence system, the broader family violence system is in evolving. We acknowledge that there are various part of the systems that already have um, expertise and work from an intersectional framework. And we also, um, 
acknowledge that the, the shared understanding of its application to family violence response is evolving, to which the work that Family Safety Victoria is developing will contribute to. Um, we also, uh, a key learning was that embedding intersectionality in practice takes time, that we're working across sectors to design and create approaches to embed intersectionality in practice across the um, broader family violence service system that it's a process of continuous learning and improvement. It's not a quick fix. There will be places where we make mistakes and that we have to take the opportunity to um, critically reflect and think about what these mistakes are and how we can improve them for um, the betterment of all. That um, undertaking intersectionality in practice inevitably involves a level of discomfort in reflecting on our own power, our own privileges and our own position within society and what we do with that. Um, and that it calls upon government, organisations and sectors to create cultural shifts um, to changes um, within our policies, our procedures and our workforce um, to be underpinned by leadership and ongoing commitment to an intersectionality approach. Um, I'll also just briefly talk about um, some of the other pieces of work that are going uh, uh, embedding intersectionally across the Victorian government. So um, in line with application of intersectionality across the family violence reform agenda, areas within the Victorian government are looking at it, their own practices, policies and structures from this lens. It means that we are building our own capability to understand and apply intersectionality, drawing upon the expertise and experiences of stakeholders and people with lived experience. Um, as you can see in there, um, the slide, um, the Department of Health and Human Services created a Designing for Diversity Toolkit. Um, and at Family Safety Victoria, we will also develop a guidance um, that's modelled on the Designing for Diversity Toolkit that will help support our staff to embed an intersectionality framework across all aspects of policy and service design. Um, the Department of, oh, my apologies for skipping that slide. Um, the Department of Justice and Community Safety have a inclusion and intersectionality unit, and they will be looking at what their processes are internally and externally as well. Um, so that Suzette mentioned the work that she's been doing at Respect Victoria, um, and there are other areas that are doing um, uh, pieces on intersectionality across the government. So we, you know, acknowledge that it will, it will take time and much reflection on practices and policies um, and our structures um, to inform practice across um, government. So um, this is just the link to the resources, the Everybody Matters video, the Everybody Matters Inclusion and Equity Statement, uh, Delkja, Safe Our Way, Strong Culture, Strong Peoples and Strong Families, 10-Year Family Violence Agreement. Um, in closing, these are the contact details for Corinne and I. And um, before we open up for questions, I'm gonna hand over to Lucy. I'm gonna stop sharing and she's gonna close our presentation with the Everybody Matters um, video. Hello? Oh, Coming up now, sorry. <laughs> I'll put myself on mute. The Everybody Matters statement is critical to building a family violence system that is able to identify and respond to family violence. So it's about each person who comes in the door being met with the same level of dignity, respect and access to service. When you include everybody in, in the strategies that you make, you're showing everyone that every single person matters, everybody and every diversity matters in this space. To minimise the family violence or to keep the woman 
children safe is a common responsibility. Everybody needs to be responsible to look after our community. It is only within a human rights framework that we can have a meaningful engagement with diversity and intersectionality. When we account for the diverse characteristics of each victim survivor, we give them the best possible chance of living a life free from violence. If a group is invisible, those individuals don't matter and those individuals are seen as somehow responsible for their own problems. It's not easy for my culture to come to say I'm family violence because it's uh, maybe not speak very well English, not to trust the interpreter. For Aboriginal people, accessing culturally safe and appropriate services is important. Failure to deliver accessible services for young people that reflect their specific needs can impact their safety and well-being and result in a cycle of violence into adulthood. Some of the problems that older people typically face accessing family violence services is first of all, they don't recognise that what they're experiencing is family violence. Women with disabilities are twice as likely to experience violence as other women and experience more extreme forms of violence over a longer period. Understanding intersectionality is incredibly important because it helps us to understand all the ways in which I might well have experienced discrimination and prejudice. It impacts on the way in which I might seek services. It might impact on the way in which I might even view certain behaviours as being violent. Taking an intersectional approach to family violence is so important because one size does not fit all. We may be Aboriginal and LGBTI, we may be multicultural and LGBTI. Just understanding that we have more than one identity. I hope that this statement will become a guiding framework that supports organisations to really embed meaningful inclusion and equity and an intersectional lens into their day-to-day -day practice. Whether that's meaningful co-design, prioritising the voice of lived experience, really supporting emerging lived experience workforce, recognising the ways in which lived experience is already a strength of the sector, and upholding and dignifying that so that when people walk in the door, their service experience is informed by an organisation's deep understanding of where they've come from and what their needs are. Success for me would be eliminating the barriers, both the structural barriers and the attitudinal barriers that currently prevent services being able to respond effectively to the whole community. Why? Well, because everybody matters. Everybody matters. Everybody matters. Everybody matters. Everybody matters. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Corinne and Mary Lee, for your presentation. Um, we're very fortunate here in Victoria to have a government that is investing time and energy in a whole of system shift. And it's really exciting um, that we're now moving towards um, operationalizing the work and the, the work on the inclusion toolkit. It's really um, exciting and we're, we're looking forward to um, hearing more about that. In fact, we've got a question from Mandy um, who um, asked, can the intersectionality toolkit be shared? Um, and I would add to that, um, you mentioned, I think Mary, around um, there's an opportunity there to um, collect feedback. Is there an opportunity to be part of that as well? So yeah, probably a question for you, Mary, if that's okay. Thank you for that question. Sorry, just had to unmute myself. Um, no Yes, uh, so Corinne, like I, as I mentioned before, Corinne and I are working through what the implementation phase would be. Um, so uh, I, I guess, Corinne, really happy for you to jump in as well, um, that we are looking to have organisations involved in uh, the testing of the resources. Um, uh, so if you are interested, uh, feel free to email Corinne and I. Corinne, did you want to add anything? Yeah, no, that's probably about it. Um, we are, I guess, in the phase of finalising the resources in response to the last phase of sector feedback and getting them um, merrim aligned and going through the formal endorsement process and through that post process, just seeking, um, I guess, our organisation's view in terms of how 
to implement the resources and as Mary said that we hope for that to include a phase of piloting the resources and with a small number of um, organisations and gathering that really on the ground feedback as how, to how they can support the sector and how we might improve them, add to them and some information about, um, in, gathering some information about implementation. So we hope to have them, I guess, available mid-year mm -hmm. in the sector. Great, okay, and we, we can email you directly to let you know if we want to be part of that, so that's great. Yep. Um, it's a good opportunity there. So, um, Also, um, I noticed you mentioned in there the guide to safe and respectful conversations, and I think in this work, it's really exciting that we've got all of the models and the research and the commitment to the work, but it's actually, how do we activate it? How do we influence? How, how do we get those in leadership inside our organisations um, to be influenced by this work? And so um, I feel that that piece kind of relates to Jess's question um, when she asks, uh, when it comes to intersectionality, how do we respond to resistance? How do we push back against, um, I guess, at the extreme level, there is a narrative out there that, um, I guess, uh, calls it leftist extremism or that talks to inter intersectionality as being something where uh, victims are coming together um, to fight against privileged groups. Now that's a very extreme view, mm -hmm. but I think um, it's important to, to have a think about that because in activating this work, they are potentially uh, viewpoints that we might um, come into contact with. Yeah. So do you have any thoughts there on how, 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 do we, how do we resist? How do we be effective in hearing that kind of resistance? Yeah, I think, um, I I just want to say to Jess, I've just looked at, you've got quite a few good questions there. So just want to say thank you for asking the questions you're asked. Um, so as we were saying, the intersectionality capacity building project, the resources are part of Everybody Matters. And um, for us, it is looking at how more broadly, how do we socialise Everybody Matters, um, the inclusion and equity statement and the immediate priorities from that. Um, as well as how do we support existing current uh, family violence reform pieces. So with the likes of um, Marum, with the work going in with um, accredited training courses, we are working with uh, broader teams at Family Safety Victoria to look at how the uh, resources can be used within those projects. Um, as I mentioned, the, the I'll call them the ICB resources instead of um, saying out the full uh, project uh, name. With the ICB resources, we are looking at them to be more of a nudge um, resources. I think what tends to happen is when from stakeholder engagement, from the feedback we've received from stakeholders, from executive, um, all the way through to the work that's happening with the agenda uh, for prevention of violence against women, there will always be a level of backlash and resistance. And if we try to mandate these resources, they do tend to it does become harder for people to want to use them because you are they feel actively forced to do these things and um so for us it is looking at what ways in which we can complement existing reform pieces to socialize the resources to get them out there i hope that answers your question uh corinne did you want to add anything as well um, yeah probably just to note that intersectionality is it, I guess a, a key focus of Everybody Matters and that is the statement, the equity and inclusion statement for um, the family violence service system uh, as coming from our Victorian government and that it is a, a key aspect of structured professional judgment within Marin. So I guess there are some, some good levers there within, I guess, um, policy and practice frameworks. Great, thank you, Karen. Um, what I might do now is ask um, Karen and Suzette um, to put, put your cameras on and unmute yourselves and we'll move to um, the panel, the virtual panel. Um, we, we have approximately yeah, 10 minutes um, to open up for questions. So there are lots of questions, which is fantastic. 
Um, I've got lots here, sitting here, but I wanted to open it up um, to you, the speakers, first to say, is there any particular question that you've spotted on that Q&A that you wanted um, to particularly tackle? And if not, I'll move straight through with questions. You happy for me to foster on, forge ahead? Yep. Okay, so um, this is a question for Family Safety Victoria, in fact, a question from Chris. He asks, how can we convince powerful actors to cede their power um, to those lacking? Does this weaken them and make them more vulnerable to malign and unwilling actors who do not want to cede their power? Um, that's a really big question. It is. <laughs> Yeah, how, how, I think it's similar to what I think yeah. I mentioned before, which is around, you know, how do we be influential to people who are in power? And so, I, yeah, go, Karine. Go ahead, Mary. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, I think it, these questions are fantastic questions and they are really complex questions. And they're, they're massive questions. And I think within Australia, we're still just starting to talk about intersectionality more broadly. Um, and I, I wonder if it's not just about looking at how we can convince powerful actors, it's about how do we socialize intersectionality and understanding of power and privilege as though it's not something to be scared of. And we will always have powerful actors who don't want to cede their power and the position of power, but how do we work in solidarity? Um, so, and how do we as allies support one another? So to Chris's point, I think it's about, well, intersectionality calls us to center the voices of marginalized people. It also calls us to um, support and act in solidarity and in allyship with people. So for us, it's looking at how do we better mobilize ourselves as um, actors within the system and how do we challenge um, more broadly these issues to um, structural inequality. Great, great answer Mary, thank you very much. Can um, I make a comment there? Yeah, Sorry. go for it, please, please is it. I think one of the issues is, um, I mean, we're, we're working against um, a patriarchy and we are doing a, a power analysis of um, various forms of um, oppression and discrimination which benefit um, a lot of people who currently have that privilege and power. Um, one of the things I've loved about COVID is um, having access to international webinars. And um, there was one recently by Arundhati Roy and another one by Angela Davis and Kimberly Crenshaw has given one. And um, the one by Kimberly Crenshaw was, was talking about how we as social movements, like the women's movement, um, the LGBTIQ, um, movement, disability activists, how we all um, need to work together um, in a, a kind of combined um, social mobilization um, because it is like your oppression is my oppression, like we are all oppressed um, by um, powers that be, um, which as somebody in one of the, the comments said is kind of a, um, a heterosexual um white um kind of um configuration so yeah i mean th there is always going to be backlash um and that's because we are challenging power structures so how do we mobilize um and get those who are on side who are in positions of power um which i think mary um has addressed as well yeah and I think um, the question that we have from Paula says that might, might follow on quite nicely there. Um, so yeah. Paula says, how can we work to address all forms of oppression and not lose sight of the focus on gender? Hi, Paula. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think um, it's really critical. So, so one of the things is, um, I think Kimberly Crenshaw's um, a, a positions um, gender centrally, but, but brings, um, um, race into that um, configuration. And I think um, to, to me, because I, I, I spent um, two decades earlier than this um, as a gender specialist and then so slowly, like what was then called social inclusion and now intersectionality has, has crept into it. To me, gender is always the base because no matter what the other forms of oppression are, um, the, the woman or the female identifying or LGBTIQ, 
in terms of um, different forms of gender, um, are always um, living an additional intersection. Um, so it, in terms of um, looking at <clears throat> violence against women and change the story, I mean, um, gender inequality was the primary driver that was looked at there. And one of the major criticisms of change the story is that it didn't have a strong enough intersectional lens. So I think what we're looking at, um, particularly in terms of family violence, because it is intrinsically gendered, and whether that is um, just women or woman identifying or LGBTIQ, um, it, it starts from, as Mary said, um, a, a legacy of, you know, three decades worth of, of women's shelters and feminist mobilising. So, so for me, it very much is gender and the intersection. Um, yeah. Great, thank you very much. And I think um, four simple words there is really key um, and very clarifying that gender is the base. And I think that's a really clear takeaway message there. Thank you. Okay, so with I think three minutes to go, um, we're going to close the panel. Thank you to all of our guest speakers um, for Thank being part everyone. of the panel today. Um, and just gonna move through towards a close. And so, um, thank you very, very much, everybody, for being part of today. Um, I'd like to thank our guest speakers, Suzette, Karen, and Mary. Thank you for so generously offering your time this morning and sharing all of your knowledge um, with us here in the southeast region of Melbourne. Um, we've, we hope that you've got just as much out of today as we have. Um, thank you to Lucy and Laura here at WISE for helping with um, the technical setup today. And um, just to note that there is an evaluation that we, of course, would urge you to take part in. It will take you three or four minutes. Um, and as this is your communities of practice, um, this is your opportunity to feedback to us how it went, what you think worked, what didn't, and where to from here. So please um, take part in that. We will drop the link into the chat function and you will get an opportunity to complete that at the end of today's webinar. Um, so please get on board. Just to let you know, before closing, our next uh, webinar on intersectionality under diverse communities will be on disability. And we will take disability as a focus for our next um, communities of practice, which will happen in a couple of months time. So please don't hesitate to get in contact with um, me or anybody here at WISE to feedback any ideas or input that you might want to have into that session. Um, and yep, yeah, lastly, again, Keep safe, have a great week, and thank you very, very much to everyone for being part of this webinar today. Thank you. Thanks, Zoe. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank Bye. you. <laughs> you too. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.